Welcome to church, everybody, man. We think that that changes how we interact with God's word when we do God's things, God's way, and we, we are a community that wants to say, welcome here. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're getting ready to dive into what God has to say. We've been doing that for a while. We have been involved in a series, and he asked the question, now, what? Why would we go back to look at the, the people who lived thousands of years before Jesus became a baby? I mean, like a lot of churches, they, they concentrate on the life of Christ. And Jesus, get this, he is the author, he writes, and the perfecter of our faith. He makes our faith perfect. He is our hope. He is the cornerstone described in the New Testament. That's an important part of a building. The chief cornerstone, that is who Jesus is. But understand, that who Christ is, he was there in the beginning when the foundations of the earth were laid, Jesus was there. And all of the stories of the Old Testament point to who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. And so when we go back, we're understanding and beginning to learn who Christ is in pursuing us. And Christ, God the Father, they pursued relationship with men. He came after Abraham, Father Abraham, and Abraham's son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob, and Jacob's son Joseph. And we look at how he interacted with people. And he said, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people, and I want to move among you, and I want to give you good things. And what he did was he called people to a wilderness experience. That wasn't just because, hey, follow me, and I'm going to whoop up on you. It's going to be hard all the time. Come on. No, no, there's, there's gifts for us in the wilderness experience. And as the whole book of Genesis ends, really with what might be the, as a standalone piece of literature, the most beautiful piece of literature ever written. It's a longer story. God is beckoning us, come and learn who I am through stories like this. There are some stories in the book of Genesis that I struggle with because I want more detail. And we've looked at some of them. When it says that an angel shows up and wrestles Jacob and that's about it, I would like some more details about that smackdown. I want to know. I want to know like who's in what corner and who the hype man is. I want to know what brought that on. Uh, when we find out that Jacob has a wedding day, wakes up the next morning and marries someone different than what he thought he was going to marry. He's like, he marries the wrong sister. And the answer is like, oh, sorry, man. Like, deal with that. Like, I would like some more details. It's in God's word. All those stories are in God's word. And there's not always a lot of details. So when I get to a story like this one, a gift found in the wilderness of reconciliation and forgiveness. And it's long. It's, it's 42, chapter 42 to chapter 45. I'm like, why is there such an emphasis on this story? There must be something important. There must be something for us here. You have to understand the setup. Joseph is a 17-year-old boy who has dreams. In his dreams, God shows him things, and Joseph interprets what God shows him this way. He says, my dreams mean that my 11 brothers will bow down before me. Joseph's on the younger side of the 11. That's a rough thing to tell the big brothers. I had three brothers or four of us in high school at one time. If I would have told them that I needed them to bow down before me, <laughs> that quickly ensuing a fight is what would have happened. And that's what happens for Joseph. I mean, he, they see him coming one day to check on them. And before he gets to them, they say, you know what we should do with Joseph? We should kill him. That's what we should do with him. Literally, stronger heads prevail and they decide to sell him instead of kill him. Joseph is sent to Egypt and over a crazy series of events, 22 years, he goes from being a slave in a house, overseeing the house, prison, overseeing the prison, to interpreting the dreams of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and from there being put in charge of a massive project to save grain and to save the whole world because a famine is coming. He is ruling over all of Egypt, second to only Pharaoh. That's the setup for chapter 42 when a story of reconciliation begins. Joseph finds himself in a wilderness that becomes a new normal. He's married, he has a wife, he has children. And on a very special day, this happens. Genesis chapter 42, verse one. When Jacob learned 
that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? That's funny to me. He continued, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Egypt is 300 miles from these guys, these brothers. I, they, they probably have heard the same stories. Jacob has to prompt them and say, why are you guys just looking at one another? Because they've heard there's grain in Egypt. Guess what? They don't want to go to Egypt, not because it's a long way away, not because calamity could happen on the journey there. It's because at the top of their heart is a snapshot series of events of them selling their brother to slave traders going to Egypt. Egypt has a bad taste in their mouth. They don't want to go on that trip because they don't want to deal with the 300-mile, six-week journey thinking about what they did to their brother. Verse 3, you can see it doesn't matter. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons, it's interesting, Israel and Jacob, they're the same person. Uh, God gives Jacob a new name, Israel. And it's always interesting in the Bible where God chooses to call him by which name. Sometimes he calls him by Jacob, his given name, and sometimes he calls him by Israel. Interesting to me here that he calls him Israel. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all of his people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly with them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them. There are several large cities in Egypt at this time. Uh, metropolitan cities. These are big cities that are uh, put out intentionally to disperse grain. There have been archaeological digs to go and find these large cisterns. There's a, there's a record of this. It is not by chance, however, that Joseph would find himself in front of foreigners that would come. The, those who are Egyptian citizens would have a, probably a different system by which they would go through to get the grain. It would not be weird for the governor to oversee anyone who comes from a foreign land to buy food. And he is going to, once he recognizes them and they don't recognize him, he's going to go through a series of accusations against them. Four different accusations he will put on them. Here's what Joseph knows. This is not the end of his encounter with his brothers because 11 brothers bow down to him in this dream and there are only 10 here. Eventually, Benjamin will have to come to Egypt. Joseph has been gone for these years. He is shaven. These men have beards, his brothers. They do not recognize him. So Joseph accuses them of being spies. You're spies and you've come to look at our land and their retort, their answer is, man, we're all brothers. Matter of fact, uh, we, we all have the same father in Canaan. There's no spies that are all brothers. One of our brothers is even back home with a dad. Joseph begins to question them about their father and this younger brother. And he says, I tell you what, here's how you're going to prove to me that you're not just spies sent to attack us. You're going to bring your younger brother. I'm going to send one of you home to get Benjamin, and you're going to bring him to me, and, and then I'll let you guys have grain. These guys are freaking out at that. Jacob did not want Benjamin to come. Joseph puts them under house arrest for three days. In verse 18, he says this to them. On the third day, Joseph said, do this and you will live, for I fear God. He sets up a new plan. Instead of sending one to get Benjamin, he says, I will keep one of you here, and I'll send the rest of you back with grain, but you must return and show me your brother, or I'll never see your faces again. There's a tension. Joseph is being cautious here, but 
in the story, in chapter 42, verse 21, we actually see what's happening. Get, get this, the scene right. Here's the second ruler of all of Egypt enthroned. He's the governor. He's in charge of lots of things. It's a massive initiative to store all this grain and start to feed people. They're two years into a famine. He has become very important because he controls the food of all the land two years into a famine. He has attendants all around him, guards all around him. But we get to listen into his brothers and what they talk about. Verse 21 says this. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. And that's why this distress has come upon us. Isn't it crazy how things just simmer to the top in our life when we get in a hectic moment? And whatever's been underneath all that, it just it comes to the top and manifests. It shows itself. I'm, I'm a little bit unnerved by the description that's given here about how distressed Joseph was and Joseph pleading for his life. This wasn't a four-minute scuffle. You took my comb, give it back. No, it's not like that. This is a big deal. This, they conspired as Joseph made his way to them 22 years prior. They made plans to kill him. They, they grabbed him, ripped his clothes off him. He begins to plead for his life. They throw him in an empty well, make a meal, talk about it. Some brothers leave and then come back before they even then get him out, tie him before their eyes, bind his hands, and then sell him to slave traders and watch the camels disappear in the distance. They did not have iPhones. This was not on their Insta story, but I'll tell you this. The pictures of their brother pleading for his life are emblazed on their heart. And they cannot get away. So much so that they get back into Egypt and in the presence of King Joseph here, they bring it up and start arguing amongst themselves. Reuben, who is the oldest, says this in verse 22. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen? Now we, we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. That's crazy. They're, they're standing there talking in Hebrew about Joseph. And Joseph understands the whole thing. Which is the irony of this. God writes great story, right? This is amazing. This happened in these men's lives. Verse 24 stops me in my tracks. It says, he turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph would break in tears at three different times in this process of haggling with his brothers. That's the first occurrence. The wilderness can teach us a few things. It can also teach us prudence. He sends these brothers on the way. Simeon stays back. And prudence in dealing with reconciliation and forgiveness is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. To be wise, to be careful. Now, some would say, you know what Joseph should have done? He should have like stopped the whole thing right there and just come out and be like, hey guys, I'm kidding. It's just me, Joseph. I've got guy liner on. You can't recognize me, right? <laughs> but he doesn't do that. And people are like, you know, you're like, he should have done that there. No, maybe you've been involved in some brokenness. And the, the wise thing for you to do is not to run into that relationship before it's time and try to make amends. There is a patience and a kindness that God shows with us and that we need to learn in a wilderness experience. But the door to reconciliation is always repentance. There is no other door to making up other than I am sorry, I have sinned. Now, you ever walk into the bedroom and the kids have been arguing and you find out this vital piece of information? Nothing happened at all. 
wait a minute, I was just down the hall with your mother and World War III broke out in this room. And I arrive on the scene and there's blood and things are broken, but nothing has happened at all? Oh, well, I'll just leave then since nothing has happened here at all, right? No, if there is brokenness in relationship in your life, here's what's happened. On my part, on your part, on both parties, somewhere, sin has happened. And the only way for true reconciliation to occur is for repentance to happen. And these men are not there yet. And shallow repentance will lead to a fragile truce. It takes time. And so Joseph keeps Simeon and the others go back carrying grain and they stop on the first night of their journey. And one of the brother goes to get a little bit of grain out to feed his donkey. And as he opens up the head of his knapsack that is carrying his grain, he's struck in with fear because the money that he had paid, the, the silver he brought to pay for the, it's there. They all open their knapsacks and find out their silver is there. They weigh it. It's exact. They get home and do the same charade in front of their father. They open their knapsacks and like, oh, dad, look, our silver is here. Oh, no. And they go on to say, Simeon's back there, by the way. <laughs> we left him. Why'd you leave your brother? Well, because he wants us to come here and get Benjamin and take Benjamin back. Jacob's got to be thinking, you guys, I sent you with silver just to buy grain. You come back with one less brother, and somehow the king of all Pharaoh was really interested in my last living son from my favorite wife. What series of conversation and events led to him caring about that? His reply is, I will not send Benjamin. It's not going to happen. We get to the next chapter and all of the food is gone. And Judah stands up and he says, Father, we're going to die. I promise you, I will stand in Benjamin's place. Like I will, I will fight for your son. We will bring Benjamin back. We have got to take him or we can buy no more food. It's been six weeks. And how awkward is this for Simeon? Simeon's married. He has children. I, I guess everyone knows, I mean, don't make grandpa rate us because he will, right? Simeon could just like stay there forever, I guess. And Judah convinces Jacob, his father, let me take your son, Benjamin. I promise we'll come back. Jacob's final words are this. He says, if I am to be grieved, then I will be grieved. And they go away with Benjamin. Back to get more food. They, they take double the silver they left with because they've got that awkward thing. It looks like they stole. So they're taking double silver back when Joseph sees them coming in the distance and realizes they've brought Benjamin with them. He tells his steward, go and kill an animal, take them to my house and prepare a, a meal at noon. I want to read that account to you. Genesis 43 Verse 18, now the men were frightened when they were taken to his house. They thought we were brought here because of the silver that was put back into our sacks for the first time. He wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as slaves and take our donkeys. <laughs> I don't understand that last part there. There's always one brother that's like, he's going to take our donkeys too. It's like, hey, if he attacks us and makes us his slaves, we're not worried about the donkeys, okay? <laughs> Always that one guy. <laughs> they, they see the steward first. This is Joseph's kind of right-hand guide. He comes out to them. They're like, hey, we want to explain the, the money. There was, the money was in our sacks the last time we left you. I love the answer of this man that's been serving with Joseph. I mean, he serves closely with Joseph, right? I mean, they've got to talk all the time. He looks at them and says, we were paid for what we gave you justly. The money that is in your sacks that you see there, it is for you from your father's God. And how many times had he heard of the true living God? The one who's actually alive and works for the good of all of Egypt through his servant Joseph. I'm sure that Joseph had told him before about his good God. So here is this meal. They get Simeon back. They're all there. And I just want to read to you the account of the meal. Here it is. When Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts they had brought into the house. 
They bowed down before him to the ground. He asked them how they were. And then he said, how is your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? They replied, your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed down, prostrating themselves before him. Eleven brothers. God's word coming true in Joseph's life. Verse 29, as he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin in his, his own mother's son, he asked, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. And I, don't, if you're confused here, I thought they're all brothers. They are. Jacob has two wives, one that he loved more. He's tricked into marrying Leah. Leah actually bears him more sons. She becomes uh, the mother of more of the tribes of Israel than Rachel. Rachel bears him two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. And when Benjamin sees his full biological brother, He's got to go away into a private residence and just weep. After he had washed his face, it says in verse 31, he came out controlling himself. He said, serve the food. They served him by himself, the brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews for that is detestable to Egyptians. The men had been seated before him in order of their ages from the firstborn to the youngest. That's got to be weird, right? They looked at each other in astonishment. I mean, how, how would they know who the older? All, they've all got beards. There's probably only one of them. Maybe Benjamin looks a little bit younger, but most of these guys have got to look the same age. They've got to be a little freaked out at this, and then this happens. Verse 34, when portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Surely Joseph is watching to see how, how will you treat the youngest brother now? How do you treat him when he's shown favor? Men, where are your hearts? What have you learned in 22 years? Where are you with repentance my grandmother, Patsy, she would always uh, have God's word on her lap. She was a woman of God's word, and she would always quote it to us. She had a few verses that were her favorite. Numbers 32, verse 23, came to my mind this week. There's this piece of it that says, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Grandma would say that to us with a big, eerie grin. We're like, Grandma, that's creepy. Like, Right? What, are you, what are you saying? What, are you, what is she saying? Does she know? Does she know? Right? She didn't have to know. God knows. And these guys get on their, horse, their camels, their horses, their donkeys in the morning, and they roll out with all this food. They got Simeon with them. They got Benjamin with them, and everything's good. And they're like, we are leaving Egypt, and we are never coming back. They've got to be thinking, bad for our family. Egypt's not been good to us. Joseph tests them again. Joseph puts a special cup in Benjamin's sack. And when they get just a little ways down the road, he says to his, his steward, go and get them. Search them. The steward does so. They find all the silver there again. These guys would be like, come on, man. Are you kidding me? We can never leave this town. And then they find the special silver king's cup in Benjamin's knapsack with all of his grain and it says the the 10 brothers are so distraught that they rip their clothes and they're like no we cannot go back and tell our dad that we don't have Benjamin we promise Judah leads the brothers back and Joseph is still at the house when he gets there and what is recorded here at the end of the book of Genesis is the longest speech given the most important part of the speech is in verse 16. What can we say to my Lord, Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. He just starts to come clean. 
Just get the scene. Here, here Judah is. Judah was the, the chief one who was arguing against Joseph at times. 22 years earlier, and Joseph is standing before him. All of attendants are there, and this plea is being made. Don't, don't do this. What can we do? What can we do? We'll be your slaves. Make, like, but not Benjamin. You don't understand. My father had two special sons, and one is dead. And this one, he says they are bound together. My father's life and this special son, their lives are bound together, and you cannot take him. Joseph has to be thinking this. 22 years too late, Judah. Like, where was this plea for me when the other brothers wanted to kill me? Like, where was this man of dignity and respect and valor and honor 22 years before? Then in verse 33, Judah volunteers himself in Benjamin's place. He says, I'll stay, but send my little brother home. Judah says, I'll take the place. It literally turns a chapter to Genesis chapter 45 because here's the deal. For reconciliation to happen, we gotta, we gotta get a breaking point where repentance happens. And Judah does that for all of his brothers. We see by their silence that their hearts are there. Not Benjamin, take us. One thing that you and I need in our lives is we need, we need reconciliation in broken relationships. And we get a look at this moment that happens here. Genesis chapter 45 begins this way. This is right after Judah's speech and plea. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. I do not believe that Joseph had spoke Hebrew up until this point. Guards are there. Men who do the work of dispensing with the funds. It's it's his house. and He's got all of these Egyptians around him. And he sends them all out. He's been speaking Egyptian. And then he says this. Verse 2. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. This is the very first TMZ report that ever happened right here. And that news carried quick. Uh, Joseph kicked all of us out, and he's with a bunch of Hebrews, and he's in there crying. That got to Pharaoh. Verse 3. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, and is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one who sold you into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there'll be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all of Egypt. Verse 14. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers, and he wept over them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. And when the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all of his officials were pleased. And there's so much here that, that Joseph's life lived out in front of Pharaoh. Thousands of gods in Egypt. Joseph would live his life in such a way that the Pharaoh would say, that young man's God is a living God. And he had such esteem and love for Joseph that when he hears that Joseph's brothers have been reconciled to him, him and all of his officials are like, awesome, good for Joseph. Good for Joseph and their God that has been so good to us on this land. There was no doubt in Egypt why they had food. It was because of Jehovah Jireh. 
It was the God of the living God of Joseph because they had food. The credit had gone to Joseph, Scott. And you look at Joseph and he's in this wilderness experience and he's got the, the vision to stand up and say, you know what, you did some stuff to me, but ease, ease up. It wasn't about you. And your sins against me really aren't about you. Get this, hurt people hurt people. If you've been hurt, you've been hurt by hurting people. Because that's who hurts people. And we have to stand up in our wilderness moments and say, the hurt that you put on me, here's where my heart is. I forgive you. I forgive you. Long before we ever have this conversation, I've forgiven you. And what you intended for evil or what the enemy has intended for evil in my life, God is doing good. He's doing good with it because he's a good God. And good God takes dysfunction and bad scenarios and messed up stuff and he just makes goodness come to it. And reconciliation relationships in our lives is what we need. Have you wasted some time in the wilderness when you could have been cultivating a heart towards reconciliation, but instead you've been feeding a root of bitterness that has grown so big in your life that you are being choked out of joy. And those people who have hurt you and harmed you, they're not even in your life anymore. They've gone on and forgot about it. But all you have is this full-grown bitter plant that is blinding you and killing you of life. You need prudence. You need wisdom in dealing with conflict resolution. But that is not letting bitterness creep up. And you know what? Jesus doesn't want from us. He's, he's not saying, I demand that you bring me treasure and gold and money. You know what he wants more than anything? He wants reconciliation in your relationships. That's the gift that Jesus wants. That's the gift that he brought us. And I get it. And I, I, I get my own response when God says, hey, reconcile that relationship. And I say, well, you know what? I didn't start it. I didn't start that fight. I didn't make that happen. They're more wrong than me. And you don't know what I've been through and you don't understand it. You don't, you don't get the pain that I have. And I, I look to you and I say this because I'm, I'm saying it to myself in my own life and every relationship that I have. When I look at Jesus and I say, Jesus, I don't have the emotional energy to go and reconcile that relationship. The last time I tried to reconcile with Crazy Train, it was a four-month Facebook mess, okay? And Jesus says, hey, what kind of judge would leave his chambers? We sing that song. What kind of judge would leave his chambers and come to us? What kind of king would leave a throne and come and dwell among subjects? When we're saying like, where's the reservoir of extra kindness and forgiveness and patience and love that I have to dole out on all of these people that have hurt me? Jesus says, I will fill it. And I will give you what you need. I will, I will pour it out. And when you are empty from giving to relationships that don't want to reconcile with you and there's nothing else and there's just silence in your relationships, he says, I will roar from the death and the grave of the relationships in your life and I will bring you a full reservoir of patience and peace and kindness and gentleness to lavish on those relationships. He is a God of reconciliation. So my dear friends, if we love Jesus, then we have to love the things that he loves and he calls us to be ambassadors of reconciliation. Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he says, if you're a believer, then as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. I want to ask our friends, our worship team, to sing a stanza over a song. And I want to do it a little, a little different. I want for us just to listen the first time through. I want to ask you to stand to your feet, and we're going to close today. And I, I want to I ask our friends just to sing this over us. And it talks specifically about our Christ laying in the silence of his grave. And you and I, we need to be asking a question. If, if Joseph can have this encounter moment where God just brings reconciliation and forgiveness back together. And, and God orchestrates that for Joseph. That we would ask the question, God, who is it in my life that you are trying to orchestrate reconciliation for your glory in? Who is that person 
that silence exists right now. There used to be joy and camaraderie and community and fellowship, and right now it is silent. We are estranged, it is cold as ice. And from the silence of that, like the silence of the grave of our Lord, he roars up, and it is, it is his victory in our restored relationships that we seek. And so Holy Spirit, as we just listen to this, would you place into our hearts the people that you would call us to, to be giving olive branches to, to be pursuing in prudence and in kindness and in forgiveness.